The storming of the Capitol building in Washington, D.C. on January 6, 2021 came as a shock. The storming of the Capitol building seemed inconceivable in the United States. And to many Canadians, it seems even less likely that it could happen here. Well, not so, says Yasser Nakve, the CEO of Inclusion Canada and the former Attorney General of the province of Ontario. Nakve says Canadians are often smug when it comes to American politics. <laughs> we like to believe that we are more progressive than our southern neighbors, that we could never elect our own Trump, that we are somehow better, less corrupt, nicer. And he goes on to say, that thinking is more than ignorant, it is dangerous. It's dangerous because we can be blind to the threats that give rise to an insurrection such as was witnessed in the United States. The key elements to be aware of, according to Nagve, are a rise in alt-right media, the undermining of science and facts, violence and the promotion of violence against others, and the chipping away of trust in public institutions. All of these elements are present and active in Canada. The responsibility of citizenship in a democracy is to debate in a civil manner, to endeavor to enhance society with courage, to seek justice and compassion. We all have those responsibilities, and we must challenge misinformation. We have to defend the rights of all, and we have to work through challenges in pursuit of better communities. We invited Yasser Nakve to join us for a conversation that matters about the state of democracy in Canada, the ever-present threats, and our responsibilities as citizens. Conversations That Matter is a partner program of the Center for Dialogue at Simon Fraser University. The production of this program is made possible thanks to the following and viewers like you. Please become a patron at conversationsthatmatter.tv. Yes, sir. Uh, welcome to Conversations That Matter. You know, we're talking about the state of democracy in Canada right at the moment because we are all looking with a considerable amount of concern to the events that happened on Capitol Hill in Washington, uh, D.C. on January the 6th. You wrote a fantastic op-ed that said we've got to be very careful in Canada not to become complacent about our own democracy. And you went so far as to say, let's not be smug. Why is it important that we remain ever vigilant in protecting, uh, you know, what democracy provides for us in our country? Well, democracy is our strength. I mean, we are in an envy of the world as a, a, a prosperous, progressive, developed country that puts people's interests and rights up in front. That has happened not by just some miracle, but that continues to happen because of the democracy we have, because of the democratic institutions we have um, at all orders of government in, in, in Canada. I think it was, uh, to me and to many, was a wake-up call as to what we saw on January the 6th. Nobody had ever thought, at least myself and many in my generation, that you will see the kind of insurrection, armed insurrection, taking place in Washington, D.C. at Capitol Hill uh, people who were hell-bent in overthrowing the government after a democratic elections. And for us to think that somehow this may not happen in Canada or somehow we are immune to it is what the smugness I was referring to and, and a, a, a caution or a warning that we need to take our democracy seriously. If we take a look at some of the elements of... Um... <laughs> I guess, or the building blocks that led to the events of January the 6th. We take a look at a uh, president who uh, repeatedly was uh, delivering a message that was false. He was basically saying that the election had been stolen from him. And he was, uh, there's no doubt about it, inciting those people who wanted him to remain as president to take some kind of action to overturn that democratic process. And you think, well, how's that possible? But those are two elements. You've got people who don't want to give up on their leader and they don't want to accept the fact that there is a democratic will that they, that they have to abide by. And so they're going to try and override that, <laughs> motivated by a leader who's encouraging them to be as vocal as possible. You know, he, he, he went right to the line, basically telling them, go storm uh, the White House without saying that. 
Um, do we in any way, shape or form have similar kinds of elements that could be at play in Canada that we should be aware of and be guarding against? Absolutely. There's, there were two elements, I think, that, that Mr. Trump um, have really capitalized on. One is stoking division. Leader's job, job is to bring people together. What Mr. Trump has been doing quite successfully is dividing people and stoking divisions. So there was, and it's now quite proven over the last week, a huge uh, element, a large number of white supremacist groups who were part of the insurrection that take place on January the 6th. They were there because their leader told them to be there. That's number one. Number two, what Mr. Trump has been doing quite successfully is is uh, is 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 a trading in misinformation, disinformation, lies, um, moving the discourse away from facts. We never saw that to that extent. Yes, politicians have stretched the truth. Of course, that 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 happens, or they give a different shade or hue uh, to the same facts. But that's robust debate that takes that, that place between between political actors, and we the people get to then decide. But to, to just say outright lies or falsehoods or 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 promote conspiracies uh, was another big element. Are those two factors? Are those two elements exist in Canada? Absolutely, they exist. We and I, in in the op-ed, I, I talk about the rise of white supremacy that's taking place. A lot of these elements, such as Proud Boys, actually originated right here in Canada. We are seeing in online forum uh, a, a large number of people engaging, way way bigger than the size of our country, in in that kind of a, a discourse. That is alarming. During during this COVID pandemic, we we saw the rise in anti-Asian, specifically anti-Chinese discrimination and racism because people try to blame the disease on a particular group of people. Not to mention, we're not immune to misinformation or disinformation either. Thankfully, our politicians in Canada are far more careful than what we have seen in the United States and, and fact checking and, and relying on facts is still important. But somehow for us to think that we are immune from uh, that type of a discourse taking place, I think would be giving ourselves a false sense of comfort. So here's a, an interesting challenge, I think, that we find in democracies. So I want to hang on to the right to argue vehemently for my position um, on the political spectrum, to say, I believe that we should be you know, here, there, or somewhere over here. But I want to do it within, I guess, the lanes or boundaries of what becomes uh, freedom of, of speech, but also respect for the system that allows us to have that freedom of speech. Does granting that freedom also create some of the challenges where people, well, they lose sight of where that boundary is and then they start to step across the line. Like, does democracy, <laughs> does it in some ways have a bit of a role in creating the environment that gives people the idea that it's okay not only for me to voice my opinion, but now I, I want to enforce it? Yeah, you know, I mean, you're asking a very important question, and we, we get into this debate all the time. I was, uh, I was, uh, I served as the Attorney General in the province of Ontario, and we often looked at issues around what is free speech and what is hate speech, yeah. right? And and as the Attorney General under the Criminal Code, I have, I had a lot of power in sort of laying charges if we felt, based on evidence, that free speech has actually moved into the realm of hate speech, and that is the line. The line is, yes, you and I are free to disagree. Yes, you and I are free to debate. Um, but if that conversation, if our actions and our words get into the world where I am now hurting, harming you, I'm promoting, willfully promoting hatred towards you because of your race, because of your color, because of your religion, because the way you look, well, our state has said, our democratic institutions have said, that's the line we do not Cross and I think that distinction is is important. Um, um, that is a distinction that we have, especially in Canada, which we pri pride ourselves in building an inclusive uh, society where we have been able to come from all parts of the uh, the world. Um, 
it is a cornerstone to reconciliation with indigenous peoples in terms of learning the truth um, uh, in order to effectively reconcile with indigenous peoples. I, you know, that's the line we have to be very mindful yeah. of. And some people f feel that freedom of speech includes hate speech as well. And this is where I would disagree with them, that, that in, a, in a free and democratic society like ours, even our charter says what, what is reasonable in a democratic society. There are even there, there is reasonable limits have been put and the reasonable limits is hate. I agree with you. And I also believe that just because some, someone will say, well, I'm free to say whatever I want. Well, you have to recognize that if you think that you have that right to say whatever you want, well, then you, by extension, are granting someone else the freedom to respond however they want. And that is when we start to get into a very, very dangerous territory. We're setting up camps that are, in essence, going uh, to battle or war with one another within a society, all because they say, well, I have the right to be able to do this. And so we have to clearly define what those boundaries are. And I think you're, you're absolutely right. Hate, anything that is going to uh, willfully uh, promote hurting another person, uh, that these are boundaries that we cannot cross. And the, the moment that somebody does cross that, I think we as individuals have to say, I can no longer listen to your message because it is not uh, promoting what we believe to be truly important values in a democracy. You know, one of the important points I, I make is that when you look at a document like the Charter of Rights and Freedom, which is, is a phenomenal document and has been copied in other parts of the world, like South Africa, once apartheid ended, the rights and the freedom that I enum enumerated in that document, the analogy I use that it's not, um, it's not a buffet, uh, it's not an a la carte, pardon me, where you get to pick and choose which rights and freedoms apply to you and ignore the other. It's a buffet. It's there for everyone. And we all get to enjoy it together. And that is the beautiful thing about the Canadian family, that what binds us together is, are those rights and freedoms, the right to f uh, free speech, the right to practice our faith, uh, the right of the media to operate uh, independently, the right to, to vote, the right to equality between not only women and men, but also between uh, all faiths, with uh, sexual orientation, gender, uh, uh, gender identity, all those things are there and we have to accept all of them together and that's how it, we foster respect and the building of an inclusive society. So how do we build that inclusive society? Because I take a look at the way that we handle immigration in Canada, and I think we're doing a pretty good uh, job of it. When we invite somebody or allow them to make that decision to come to Canada, we say, you come here and you have access to the full buffet, to use your term, of the Canadian experience. You can seek out those jobs, uh, uh, education. You can live where you choose. You can vote the way that you want to. You don't have like specialized or categorized citizenship. You become a citizen of this country. And I think in doing so, what we're saying to the people who come here who want to embrace and live in that kind of society, it's also yours to protect. You have a responsibility, as we all do, to hang on to those values that are so important to us. Do you think that sort of at high level, we're doing it right in Canada? You know, I think Canada is a work in progress. We have, we've gotten it right uh, more than many, many places in the world, including, including our friends and neighbors uh, south of us. Uh, but I, don't, I won't be, ever be smug to use that term again that I use yeah. to think that we've got it perfect. Uh, we still have a lot of work to do, and that's that's at the heart of the work that we do at the Institute for Canadian Citizenship is is to promote active citizenship, is to say, with citizenship comes certain rights, right? Right to vote, right to run for office, right to serve in the jury. But we don't just end at those rights. We have responsibility yes. that comes with citizenship as well, right? Which is to help build the society, our communities, our neighborhoods, our economy and we say we do it by in an inclusive way and the way you build that inclusion is by recognizing that we all are different by learning about our, di our differences because i think that makes us rich and celebrating those differences homogeneity is not going to <laughs> not going to make us 
great is those the strength comes in when we when we accept and understand and celebrate our differences because that what gets us uh, to the to the next sort of level of of, of progress um, the other responsibility that we are quite actively promoting is the respect uh, responsibility of every Canadian citizen to reconcile with the indigenous people to learn the truth whether you've been here six <laughs> generations or just came six years ago we have a responsibility as a citizen to reconcile with the indigenous people so that's i think that goes to the the core of the work but i do want to say one thing Stuart, which which is let's not take our democratic institutions for granted let's right. not take our democratic right for granted please go and vote please run for office if you think that decisions are being made that does not represent your interest yes of course you have the right to protest uh, absolutely, that's part and parcel uh, uh, of our freedoms, but you also have the right to vote, to elect people uh, that um, will speak to things that are important to you. If you don't can't find that person, well, run for office, join a political party, which is also a right. These things are all within our, our, our realm, and, and our democracy is as good as the participation of our citizens, people who put their name forward on the ballot, the number of people who turn out to vote. And that's why I make the point that we cannot take that level of engagement for granted. I think you're absolutely right. I think that we do have that responsibility to be engaged, to be informed, to do the work to understand where the truth, uh, uh, where it is along the spectrum of information that we're being uh, given and that we must vote. I think we need to make our democracy relevant. And this is where I think the responsibility also lies very much on our elected leaders. Uh, I've been one. This is where engagement with the public, with your con constituency, and our, our politicians do work hard, is extremely important. It's a two-way street. We just cannot just make the argument that people need to just come out and vote. The reason we see the voter turnout diminish is I think people are starting to feel that their vote does, does not count, that their vote is irrelevant, that once people get elected, they will make decision which serve an interest that is not their own interest. And so the responsibility then goes on to those who are elected to, to, to make sure that there is this two-way engagement, there is this two-way conversation, and, and, and they are more uh, accurately and properly articulating as to why certain decisions are, are, are being made. It's not easy to make decisions when you're elected, but I think the responsibility to explain is, is, is important. And, and I think it becomes clear in moments of crisis like the one we're living in right now where our leaders are really stepping up it's a very difficult circumstance. I cannot even be imagine being in those cabinet rooms where decisions are being made about whether to impose a curfew or make people stay at home. We're almost coming to a year point. Um, and kudos to our elected leaders for being there in front of the media every single day, trying to speak to Canadians, trying to explain those decisions. But I think where when they fail is when you start seeing a little bit of politics coming into rollout of vaccination. Uh, type of things. This is where I think politicians have to be very honest and frank and say, look, we're doing our very best. This is why we're failing. It's okay to fail, but acknowledgement those failures. I think if people will see humility, people will see best effort, you will see higher engagement um, in our uh, in our democratic processes. That's, that's what my feeling is. I don't think there's a, a, a silver bullet out there but no. uh, engagement has to be a two-way street. Well, I agree. It does. But I think that we also, as citizens, have to be careful not just to point the finger at those people who have decided to stand up for what they believe in uh, is a vision for the best for their uh, constituency, uh, whether it's local, uh, municipal, regional, provincial, or national. I mean, you, you did it. You, you put your name forward. Uh, you, you, you did that. I also, as a citizen, have a responsibility to stand up for what I believe in. And part of what I believe in is that we have to protect democracy and we also have to push back against hate and violence.
and and we need to have the 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 instruments available to us to be able to do that yeah and 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 remember i think in the in in the era of of social media uh, our voices are stronger Mm -hmm. uh, because now we have channels that we can use to air our opinion. Now, I say that, but I also mm -hmm. lament the fact that those hateful voices have taken over, right? And I think part of the challenge we're seeing um, in the free speech going into the hate speech realm is that people now feel, one, those who promote hatred have a, a megaphone uh, in their hands, and by hiding their identity, they are able to um, say whatever they want to, whether it's factual or most of the time not factual. Um, so there, it is, it, it is a double-edged sword. And and I mean, some yeah. of the work that we have been doing at the Institute for Canadian Citizenship, in partnership with Government of Canada, is is how to uh, create tools where people can use to fight disinformation, misinformation, not only to differentiate between facts and uh, information that is not accurate, but also give them license or the agency to just not be bystanders, but to speak out and call out when they see uh, mis or disinformation uh, being spread uh, online. And um, it's easier said than done. It's, I think it's one of those things that we will just have to keep doing it again and again and again at a repetitive level until it becomes our nature to, to just correct people who are spreading incorrect information. Yes, it is a collective learning experience, isn't it? So for somebody who's watching who goes, okay, how do I find out some more information? Where can they go to get uh, further information uh, and, and tap into some of the resources that you can provide them with? Well, come to our website, inclusion.ca. Uh, that's our home site for the Institute for Canadian Citizenship. It's rich with information around all the various things uh, that we've been, we've been discussing. Um, in there, you will also see links to other uh, organizations across the country who are doing some amazing work um, as well. It's the partnership that really makes this, this happen. This is ongoing work, uh, what we, you and I are talking about. It is uh, work that needs to go on. Um, um, there is no, I don't think, an end date to the work that we are all doing uh, collectively and it's, it's important that uh, we engage more people. So check us out on inclusion.ca. I agree with you completely. We all have a responsibility to remain committed to this always. Uh -huh. It's not something that you can say, oh yeah, I, I, I checked that off on my to-do list. I don't have to go back and revisit it. Yes, you do. Um, so thank you very much for taking the time to give us a, you know, an overview of, of where we're at and things that we need to, uh, to take on as a responsibility for ourselves. I, I really appreciate you taking the time to have this conversation with me. Well, thank you, Stuart. I really appreciate your time.